Shelley Miscavige. She has not appeared in public since 2005. Where's Shelly and what happened? Where is Shelly? We're looking at like 17 years of a person just missing. Shelly Miscavige was given into the sole care of L. Ron Hubbard by her parents when she was 12. This is where Shelly is believed to be being held captive. Do you believe that Shelly Miscavige is a threat today? Oh, absolutely. She's seen it all. She's been by his side the whole time. Welcome back to the channel. I'm your host for today, Claire Headley, and this is the next episode of my series, Where is Shelley Miscavige, in which we have been diving deep into the life of Shelley and the uh, and talking with people who actually knew her personally. My special guest for today is my friend, Dylan Gill. Welcome, Dylan. Thank you. Thanks I'm so for glad you're me. here today. Absolutely. And so as we were talking about before we started here to give a short summary before we get into our topic for today, because I'm sure we could spend hours talking about your Scientology story, but you were born into Scientology and also then later spent seven years in the Sea Organization and in those seven years interacted with a new Shelley. Do you want to just kind of give me the broad strokes of uh, what led up to that part of your life? Um, sure. Yeah. No, um, growing up, um, uh, my family were artists and musicians, so they kind of, um, were involved in Scientology in Northern California at the time, which was kind of a big hub. Um, the Los Gatos mission, Stevens Creek, a bunch of, those were very big money makers, um, at the time for the Scientology mission network. Um, I spent a lot of my time in Santa Cruz, Concord, San Francisco org, um, just doing courses, doing TRs with people. Um, you know, at that time it was the harder TRs, so you had like two hour passes. Um, so, you know, every for some reason people needed a lot of people to do that with. So as a kid, and, you were like, I'll do it. Yeah. And that was at the time, am I correct in saying that that was not only just two hours of sitting comfortably, but not even blinking, right? At that time? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. That was, there was always kind of a back and forth. Like everybody, I remember as a kid, you know, my aunt was the course supervisor at the mission. Um, and they were always scouring references to find out natural blinking, you know, no blinking. Um, so <laughs> it was, I think it was for the Santa Cruz for the mission network. Um, it was pretty much like if you blinked more than a couple times in a minute, it would get flunked, but otherwise it was like sort of okay. Um, Cause it was impossible. I remember doing a couple, like starting OTTR zero, just being like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and your eyes start and, tearing up and you're yes, like. Yes, yes. And what, what <laughs> age, what age were you at that point? Uh, like 10, Ugh, 11, yeah. you know, that kind of. And we were, um, I don't know if we were one of the only, I think they were doing it all over, but um, they used to sell uh, Dianetics books door to door. And that yes. would be something that the missions and I, we'd get dropped off with a book, you know, they'd be like, how many books do you want? You're just like uh, two, one, I don't know. <laughs> you know? And then you're, <laughs> you were tasked with selling it. Um, and that's kind of what I did as a kid. And then when I wasn't, when we weren't doing that, we were doing art shows and traveling around California, Arizona, New Mexico, Tahoe, that kind of thing. Yeah. Interesting. I have I have similar correlations with my experience in England. At one point, they had a, a giant Dianetics bus and they loaded up all the cadets onto the bus and took us to like a busy town nearby. We all had a stack of Dianetics books and we weren't allowed to go home until we'd sold all of them. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and they were like 15. I want to say it was like $15 at the time is what it was what you had to get for them. Yeah. Um, and right 15 or 20, I don't think it was 20, 20 just seems like it was too much. Um, but yeah, it was definitely, and I remember my, when the basics came out, even though I had done the HQS, you know, um, my dad was like, well, you're going to do self-analysis next, but I can't pay for it. You have to get your exchange in. And so selling Dianetics book was the way that I could make money to do courses. And wow. That, that your parents were those. requiring you to do and requiring you to pay for Oh, absolutely. Uh, yes. and it was, and it was translated, you know, 
I think one of the demises of um, the the organicness of it all was the PTSSP. Yeah, and of course, that's the made... study of potential trouble source, suppressive person, all of that, uh, of any person. If you get sick in Scientology, it's always because you're connected to an evil person, all of that jazz. Yeah, absolutely. It's It basically made a lot of people paranoid. You know, my... My family that was in Scientology, you know, instantly found my great grandmother as the, the head SP. And, you know, it was just so weird. It was like it made them into like everybody was a, you know, a potential trouble source or a suppressive person. And yes. it was, you know, it was that's like, why would you inhibit us from doing Scientology? It, you know, you have to be the SP. It's like she was born in 1910, maybe. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> like they're going to have different opinions. So. Um, wow. And did your family yeah, end so. up disconnecting from her then? Yeah, well, they <laughs> she made really good food. So it was kind of a shade, a gray, shady area. <laughs> so she, they would still come <laughs> and they left. What was weird is that my uncle and dad did all that. And then he my father left me with my great grandparents while he would wow. go do art shows as I was getting older. And it was hard like mentally it was really strange because I remember, you know, a lot of the things growing up were you know, the OT3 materials are going to be in the Oakland Tribune. Don't touch it, mm -hmm. you know, and you couldn't go near it because it was like terrifying. You'll get pneumonia and die. Like it, right. it was. And I remember looking at the, you know, paper on the coffee table, just being like, oh my God, that's what it is. You know, that's it. It could be, <laughs> and I can't, don't look at it. And I never looked at it and, until way later, but. Wow. Kinda, Interesting. And so, yeah. and so then how old were you when you joined the C organization? Uh, the first time I was recruited, I was 11, 12. Um, wow. And, but it was, and it was during a lot of those missions that um, I want to say it was like during the international training or the, um, the, where they're trying to get a lot of that. It was like ITT or um, T TTC. TTC, yeah. yeah. So Texas. that's, that's yeah. where they're recruiting people in to go on full time training to make lots of auditors or counselors. Right. To go back to the, or part of the whole birthday kind of, pr once you get in, you, you, get the other side of it um but i was too young and so they put me on a project prepare for a couple of years and the next time um recruiters came through the san francisco org i was doing my student hat and you know taking a train in from out of, so they were able to talk to me for a while before my dad got involved and um at that time i was pretty excited about joining and um, but it was, you know, like when you go to sign that contract, it's such a diff, like it's, it's so final. It feels like it, it's, it's hard not to have like some things come, or at least for me, I had a lot of anxiety come up and, um, well, sure. Did, and you were but, 14, right? Or there. Right, well, <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I was 14. Um, <laughs> like I, I, sorry, just as a side comment, I, you're, you're a, a dad, I'm a mom. I look at my kids now uh, and I have their entire lives and compared notes as to like, oh my gosh, my, like my oldest son right now is, is the age where I'd already been in the C organization for a year and a half. I was already married by that point. And he's in, he's a senior in high school, you know, it's just mind boggling. Right. My, mine just, my oldest just started high school. Um, wow. and he's actually the age, um, I was joining and in the Sea Org. And I, so a couple of years, a year and a half ago, I had that same kind of like realization of, holy crap, I was, I had no idea what I had in store for me and nor right. was I prepared for it. Right. You like, know? can you imagine your son right now contemplating signing a billion year contract? <laughs> no, I, and I can't imagine being that person that says I bought you a one-way ticket to Florida. Right. You know, and there you go. Like, yeah. Buy, I'll help you pack. You're leaving tomorrow, <laughs> you know, and you're just like, "Holy crap!" <laughs> okay, yeah. let's do this. And then you know, you have that decision as a as a child. I decided I would be the best I could be. I would do right. the best I could do because I had no other no other choice. You know, yeah. So it was uh, it was a kind of a kind of an interesting. You know, it's one of those where you, I guess, you're numb for so long you don't realize it, and you just sort of do it and you go through the motions and you know, but with the Sea Org, it was like the motions were at 100 miles an hour, seven days a week, you know, 120 hours a week. So it was, yeah. it was trial by fire. I 
think. Yeah, <laughs> and it and it seems that in your case, especially and certainly for me, that growing up in that environment, even the the concept of a billion year contract was you were not a stranger to that. It was normalized by virtue of your surroundings and the people around you. Would you? say that's correct yeah the file clerk I, my file clerk went back that far yes for sure <laughs> um, um yeah no i was totally familiar with the cons i you know as a kid i remember reading the history of man was like those were the risky books yes. you know like all the cool dirt stuff and that's you felt like you were almost um you get in trouble if you read those you know where self-analysis not so much and his, how, you know, the what history about, of man. have you lived before this life Oh, yeah. Have you lived? That was huge. But even History of Man, the first couple versions and even Science of Survival, sort of. Um, but yeah, those were the books like my dad. We when Road to Freedom came out, that's all that played in our car. Like, that's what was played. I know yeah. every word still. Yeah, I know that. I do, too. It's really <laughs> disturbing. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, I still kind of like the tunes of a couple songs. So it's kind of weird. <laughs> Like oh the trauma, God. it reminds you that the trauma runs deep, right? Yes, yeah. it really does. Yeah. So, you, so you were fourteen when you when you started. And I got sent to Florida. Yeah, and I got sent directly to Florida from Northern. I was California. recruited for Flag Crew. That's oh, who wow. I was originally, and Mick Davies was the the commanding officer then. Wow. Um, okay. And so, so and your I, parents were okay with you going all the way across the U.S. With no, that you had, did you have family in Clearwater, Florida at oh, that absolutely time? Absolutely not. I knew nobody. I knew wow. no, zero people. How um, terrifying was that, and, by the way? Uh, that was my first plane flight I ever took, was San Francisco to Tampa, Florida. Yeah. Wow. And it was a, I think it was a red eye. It was like stats. Like I was a statistic. Yeah, meaning that you was, had to get, you had to arrive before Thursday, 2 p.m. That's right. To be a number on a graph. That's right. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. I was wow. stuck in a room with this like 65 year old, like really rugged looking sailor that they had recruited from the free winds when they'd originally bought it. And wow. he, they like, they tried to recruit. That's what's interesting about Scientology. Like I recruited people from a young age. I was really good at selling and I understand how to find someone's ruin and get them to say yes until they can't say no. And, you know, real basic concepts that you grow up with, which is terrifying later in life because right. my kids would never grow up that way but um yeah it was you know um it was definitely um i totally forgot what i was saying Sorry. <laughs> you you know you were talking about the arriving and the 65 year old guy from the free winds and uh yeah it was the most you... terrifying experience i had to they stuck me in a room in the you know middle of the night and i woke up with this guy that it was crazy. It was just so strange. And he was being fitness boarded out. Oh, wow. Later, I found. And so he ended up being like kicked out of the because he couldn't finish um, the basic Sea Org staff statuses and, and the estates project force. I see. Um, so uh, and I, I didn't know that at the time. I figured that out. So then I did the EPF. Um, Which is the midway. The boot camp to train course. you yeah. to do whatever you're told to do unquestioningly unwaveringly no questions asked right no human emotion reaction no any right you've done yes. this job before your talent boots in the sky like a lot of interesting policies um for sure and, boots in the and the sky. Staff status remind is, me remind me of that one um well it's kind of like with boots in the sky it's like it's the i can't remember the direct quotes um, but it was kind of like, you've done this before, like pull up your bootstraps, you know, and, and get this done basically. Yes. So it's, it's like an estimation of effort kind of. Okay. So same, thing, same, you know? same vein of the motto of the C organization. We come back. You've been, you've done this before. This right. is not just right. like pick up where you left off kind of a thing. Right. Exactly. And it, it's something that you, you know, just assimilate into any job and be competent in it yeah. and, you know, that was kind of so I did the the estates project force, um, and then midway through the estates project force, I was told that I was um, traded, or some other people to the Commodore's Messenger Org in Clearwater, Florida, okay. and so then I went directly to the CMO EPF, and did all the drills and everything, the training that you need to be able to become a messenger, yeah. and um, 
then I was stuck in the uh, missionary unit with a bunch of like Carl Light, Paolo Fonti, Jeff Lumberg, uh, a bunch of guys. And um, and, and sorry, I I should have asked. So what year was this now? Uh, this was like 86, 80, okay. 85, 86. Um, okay. So had Hubbard, was it before or after he had, he had died? I was at the death event. So it oh was right. And gosh. I remember the loyal officer issues um, showing up at the base for like a day and a half <laughs> and then being gone all of a sudden. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it was so, like, no, so let, nothing to see so, here. <laughs> okay. So I, I would, I just, I know it's a off topic, but I'd love to pick your brains for a moment on that. Tell me what that was like and what your thoughts were at the time. And, and, and then explain what the loyal officer thing was for those people who probably have no idea what that is. Yeah. Um, so being a newly, like being a new messenger, um, the LRH death event was really odd because um, we were our factor. We were told in no uncertain terms um, that we were not to show emotion at the event. We were not to, what he would want is this, us to get right on producing, get right back on post and get our stats up. Yeah. Like that's exactly how we were handled. Um, um, so the loyal officer issue coming out and the LRH death event were, were pretty like close in proximity of times. The LRH death event obviously happened first. Um, and I was a, a messenger at the time in, in the, at the flag land base. Um, and we were immediately told not to feel or express any emotions towards this happening. Um, and you know, even though joining the Sea Org was really scary, um, one of the only things I brought with me was my letters that LRH had responded to. And because hmm. they were very personal, like they were, he responded to personal things I had said to him as a child. Um, and, you know, at the time I thought he had actually responded. He didn't have a unit for that. It makes sense, but I thought yeah. he did. Um, so it was very, like a lot of the messengers that were there, um, one of the, the people and I don't I think we were we were dating at the time um was Bronwyn and um she she's a third generation from Australia and so her parents had been on the ship. I used to eat lunch with her parents all the time. Um they both were in the flag service org. So it was is a really odd like the the actual event itself, although it was very, you know, um there's a lot of knowledge being brought, you know, given to us. It, you know, everybody was kind of in shock of like you, this bigger than life person for all intents and purposes had just suddenly passed. Like, right. and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, oh, he's sick or, oh, there's something. It was just like, and then immediately following, um, I, I want to say they were just posted almost everywhere was the loyal officer issue. Yeah. And um, it was, you know, that, that Pat and Annie Broker were trusted people and, they were moving to the ranks of loyal officers and, and LRH was moving to target two and becoming the admiral. And which seemed weird, honestly, because everything <laughs> said Commodore on it. But um, other than that, it was like, okay. And everything felt normal for about a day or two. And then there was an order to like, everything is removed. Now all of a sudden they're in big trouble. Um, and it was, it wasn't that, Oh, Pat and Annie are in trouble. It was like, something was off. Huh. Um, and one reason why I know that is I was um, in charge of human resources in uh, the messenger org and all our the lines that we had from from international management um, were usually pretty consistent in their orders. And um, it's funny that you mentioned the time machine, because I remember that coming out because the Merc was really nice before the time machine <laughs> and the time machine made it very not cool anymore because even yeah. if you didn't get the message so and yeah. yeah and so the merc system was the internal email system and then that right. started to be linked to time machine so if you didn't answer or you you just started getting stacks and stacks of knowledge reports on you sp spat out by the computer right yeah chits you'd get chits and it was terrible and that i believe was um all shelly miscavige doing <laughs> doing That's... instituting that on the merc system because of how many orders, you know, DM was running around trying to be a little um, L. Ron Hubbard, right. you know, running around giving orders and having, you know, using his messenger set up to like 
put his, you know, center himself in every situation in Scientology. So yep. she no, was there absolutely. to facilitate that, you know. And you're um, right. And I remember Shelly talking to me about that on numerous occasions, how essentially the whole purpose of that time machine system was it would tell you who was effective on their positions right. and who was not. And therefore, it, the computer would do all the work automatically of telling you who was a bad apple, so to speak. <laughs> Well, and that's kind of, you know, that's all of um, Marvel Universe and Avengers, um, but it's also Incom. Like, Incom was always trying to, you know, act like they were ahead of the electronic in age when really they were just, you know, like, Sir was the biggest thing with Incom, you know, source information yeah. retrieval. That yeah. was the idea and, of being able to. Yeah, and sorry, so Incom, did, if, correct me if I'm wrong, by my recollection, that stands for international network of computer organized middle management or management management yeah i don't okay. think it's middle management i think it's yeah management um because they yeah, always make the acronyms really confusing because mm for management <laughs> right right no exactly and it's um income was something i had almost zero to do with when i was in the sea org other than like i did have a lot to do with um, OSA, Able, Wise, um, CCH. I helped when I was in uh, the International Extension Unit. Um, I did a, a ton of missions into those areas. Okay, but, so, but yes. to finish up on the death yes. event, um, yes. we, as, as for my experience, it was very um, mis emotional. I felt very sad and I felt lost, but I felt like I had to lean on my purpose of wanting to make the world a better place and, and that what we were doing was paramount to that effort. Um, and so I think we just went about our business and, you know, and did it. So it was, and then after that, you didn't hear anything. Like, honestly, um, the, the reorg, um, reorganization that happened was so subtle that on, um, a continental unit viewpoint, it, it, it didn't affect us. Our our biggest okay. priority as a messenger unit in Florida was to make a million dollars a week. That was our biggest priority. Okay. Interesting. Well, thanks. Thanks for sharing your thoughts. I always, anytime I, I speak mm -hmm. to somebody who was around at that time, I'm always want to get their perspective, but okay. So you're in Clearwater, Florida. And when, when did you first meet Shelly? Um, I didn't meet Shelly until I um, was on lines to go up to CST and then later um, at, at Happy Valley. Okay. And that's, so by that time, I... you were at the headquarters in Gilman Hot Springs, California? Um, no, the first time I went to the headquarters um, at Gilman Hot Springs was to go to the household unit. And okay. I was already the estate secretary at the Church of Spiritual Technology. Wow. So, so you went from clearance lines directly to CST, Church of Spiritual yep. Technology. Wow. Okay. That's right. Yep. And what year was that? And how old were you at that point? Um, it was like 1988, 89. Okay. Um, and I would have been, I don't know, how old I was. <laughs> <laughs> like 19 or something, or something like okay. that. So 18, 19. Think, okay. Yeah. And were you married by this point or no? Yeah, I'd been married to Brian. Okay. So um, I don't know if you can hear that. It's dumping here. Um, no. So Bronwyn and I got married in Clearwater. And um, I actually, I was 16. I had to forge my marital things to get married. That's a whole nother story. Um, wow. But because we were, we were going to go out, we were going to get RPF. We were going to go out 2D. There was no doubt about it. We we're, she was the um, the head of the human resources department, and I was her and, like right hand man. I was okay. And this, so you were both there. in the messenger organization in Clearwater. That's right. Yes. Okay. And um, I had done two or three um, missions prior to get the in like PPR missions, which was project uh, personnel procurement, um, and or yeah, personnel resources personnel procurement resources. Um, and those were to man people up to get everybody, go through everybody on the base and see who's qualified for what level of management. Okay. 
um, and then try to get those people out or do replacement cycles. Like, you know, the human resources in, in the Sea Org is pretty chaotic. Yeah. Um, it's <laughs> we had a we had a term called musical chairs and it was you know when you when you're on those lines of manning missions and doing personnel that's always the thing that's going to like get you in trouble right is, you know disrupting an area or the stats go down or, or you know it's it's like a very fine line you have to walk um yep. so she bronwyn and i were both um i guess determined because after after i did a couple of the missions we started going through CMO and uh, senior HCO, like the the senior uh, personnel department for the whole flag land base, which have you know there was like four people in there, like John Lundeen, Don Jason, and like a senior HCO person, um, and that was about it. Like so, there weren't you know, and John Lundeen couldn't be touched because he was the finance director for the flag land base at the time. Oh wow, yeah. And so he was really involved in. Um, recruiting or um reg registration and and getting money in he was so, probably Ron instrumental was, to the million dollars a week that you were talking about yeah well they he drove a corvette <laughs> wow for mid sale so did ron norton they both they drove matching corvettes so and was that from from having money from um uh, bringing in like would they get commissions even though they were in the yeah at the time they would oh. get commissions yeah yeah it was um it's wow. quite a little racket that went right. on for a while that got nipped in the bud. It, yeah, was yeah. it? So it was a field staff member commission. Wasn't that like 15%? 15%. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So you're doing 100,000 bucks. You're doing a couple hundred grand a, a week. You know, I mean, that's good money. That's that's right. good. That's good money. Well, you can buy a Corvette with it, like outright as a Sea Org member. Right. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I drove, I rode in a bus. Like, you know, it was kind of, or whoever would <laughs> leave, like public would leave cars. Like, and they'd be like, oh, you can drive your car back. And you, the liability, the risk was ridiculous. But at the time, if somebody would like say, hey, use my car to drive back and forth, when we moved out to the Hacienda, um, it was kind of a trek. So yeah, it yeah. was like sweet. And yeah. there would be like nine people jumping in a car to get there. And like, you didn't have to take the bus. That was all that mattered. Right. Um, get get a few, a little bit extra, a little extra freedom I mean, goes a long way. Yeah. Five minutes for breakfast. Like, oh my gosh. And before muster and, you know, before all those hard stops you have, if you're not at muster, you are almost immediately considered blown. Yes. So you have to, you know, those are certain places you have to be unless you have express permission not to be there. Yeah. Um, it's so crazy oh yeah, Bronwyn, that you, when you couch it like that, it just reminds me of the contrast of the life of a Org member versus in in real life out in this world i mean yes you there are people who have nine to five jobs but it's just nowhere you cannot compare any any aspect of the life of a Org member to real life right yeah no i mean we did chinese school like every day yeah like we we would chinese school and that just i mean I, that's a i think that's a normal term right <laughs> isn't it I, you know, I don't know. Go ahead and go ahead and explain it for anyone listening that has no idea what you're talking about, if you would. Right. Well, so Chinese school, um, and especially being in the human resources department, um, you were tasked with, you know, executing certain policies and whatnot. So one of the policies was to take the whole org at muster. So everybody's lined up and you take either a quote from a policy or an actual, like for us, we did a lot of the um, messenger orders that were either from or written by, L, you know, LRH. Um, you know, and one was like, you know, um, a messenger on duty or doing a, a task is an emissary of the Commodore. What is being said or done to that messenger is being said or done to the Commodore. Um, and so we would take it line by line and it'd be written up in big letters. And usually the master at arms with his swagger stick would be up there and he would be pointing at it going, I'm asking, and then everybody is in unison would repeat what he said. Um, so we would do that, yeah, quite often. Like chanting, <laughs> chanting it out loud. Like the, right, the, right, the exactly. classic example, and it's crazy to me, and I'm sure you're the same way. You can't walk that back. Like it's impossible to never, oh, to not yeah, think of, yeah. if you think, oh, what's the definition of a team? It like literally just starts rattling without, <laughs> without yeah, conscious thought. Yeah, it's hard thought. to. Um, it's, it's weird when you look back at the conditioning that you like how much stuff was normalized 
so easily or so willing to normalize that behavior in the name of purpose and in the name of helping you know those yeah. are big buttons for humans you know we yes. all you know and then it creates later in life issues with helping people yeah you know you, you, it's right. it's very it, it's you know it's you have to live with that trauma that's not something that you can just delete it, it's no. you know it's something that was is so ingrained with basic human you know exchanges that you have to just sort of be like hey i'm a little different in some areas sorry you know, <laughs> never apologize though <laughs> never right, apologize right. <laughs> right right yeah anyway okay so back to i think we were talking about you got married with to bronwyn when you were 16 right right um so we were we were on you know on post and and they were there was a lot what's interesting about and just a small segue um is the difference between management and then the lower level management um and then the lower orgs so we had a, we knew a lot that was going on, but there was a lot that we didn't know, but we felt the the pressure and the intention of it. Um, so it you could deduce a lot. Like they needed people up at in. They needed yes. people for special projects. That it was very obvious in my position that that was a they that international management had their attention on needing more people that were qualified. Yeah. Um, it wasn't until later that I kind of realized because a lot of people left. <laughs> like, <it> was, <laughs> oh yes so, right good point um but either way so bronwyn and i ended up being um some of the more qualified people um around so she got sent early and went through clearance lines which meant clearance lines basically meant um going through all your personnel uh ethics and uh pre-clear folders or your auditing folders um, and then basically going through everything you've ever done, your family, uh, and then tailor making uh, sec checks or security checks, questions to see if they'll read on the meter. Um, right. And so, it, and for the Church of Spiritual Technology, it was quite um, a little different because you had um, another layer of secrecy. You know, yes. so there was like non-disclosure agreements that were signed um, and all that. So she was sent up and went up and I couldn't even know where she was. Like contacting her was like nearly impossible. Yeah. Uh, once I got uh, sent from Florida to uh, Los Angeles, I was then on clearance lines to do the same thing. And even then it was called LRH Archives. It wasn't called uh, the Church of Spiritual Technology. That's right. So I, I had no about clue. That. Right. And there was a big, um, and even I was a part of it in flag. There was a big push in the eighties and probably maybe even later, um, to find every handwritten LRH thing, tape recording and, and flag had a ton everywhere had a ton. <laughs> it was kind of crazy where they were just all over in like random filing cabinets. And, um, so there was always this push for everybody to like locate original documents and get them up to the LRH archives project. Yes. Um, and so when I was on lines down in the, the Pacific area commander pack, it, um, like Mike Gilchrist was my sec checker at the time. You might've known who Mike I worked and with Andreas Mike very closely. Yeah. Yes. Right. And uh, did you know, Andreas Galbriati? I didn't know Andreas. I knew, you know, Ricky, Ricky. Yes. Ricky yeah. Jensen. You knew Ricky. Okay. Ricky. She was married to him for a while. Yeah. yeah. Jensen. With, yeah. Yes. Jensen. Yes. Jensen. <laughs> Jensen. Yeah. I worked, I worked with both Ricky and her sister, Meta. Oh, Meta. Okay. Yeah. I didn't ever get to meet her. Um, but I was, I, when Ricky and Andreas were in Florida, they lived right across from us in, in 2D birthing. Oh, wow. So we'd see them like every day. Um, so, yeah, Bron was up line. So I had 2D birthing. I had like couples birthing in pack. So I stayed in Leb Lebanon Hall in the fourth floor. Even though and Bronwyn Spider wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. Aren't awesome. you lucky? Um, <laughs> that changed in I, later years. It was years. totally cool. <laughs> right. I bet it did. Um, and even at the time, like, so she'd be able to come down for libs um, like once a week kind of thing. And Tom Vorm would come down. And of and, course, and visit. libs was if you had your stats up back at that back at that time they would give you a day off right and that was liberty and I think yeah when you're when you're on like 
lines, you know, clearance lines going up and the other, per like, you know, one of the purposes I figured out later um, with CST from the advices was, is they wanted a lot of couples, like caretaking couples for long-term care of the facilities. Yes. And that way the people, you know, it's, it's easier that way. So that's, their emphasis was to recruit couples. So that's one thing that made us extra qualified is we were not only qualified because we'd both grown up in Scientology and been, you know, our, we had pretty clean, you know, my ethics folder was like, got big, it wasn't very big. <laughs> yeah. um, and Bronwyn was even better. Like Bronwyn is clean as pure as the driven snow. Yeah, and, um, as, and as we've talked about before, Bronwyn and I were both in the cadet org in England together. Yeah, in Greenfields, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Uh, yeah. It's such a small, like Aaron says, two degrees of separation. It's so true. It's it's so crazy. Yeah. Um, very, very small. So yeah. She got sent up. It took me. Um, so I started, <laughs> I, I was always on mission airlines. So I started doing a bunch of missions. I ended up being the, the preps briefing and firing director for CMO IQ because CMO. Yeah, ahead. no, sorry. I was just going to say in missions is where there's some situation and, and it requires urgent attention and handling. And you have to pull together some people who are going to have a set of marching orders and they're going to swoop in and fix everything. Would, would that be how you would accurately summarize missions? Yeah, there, there's um like that would be like a situation handling mission for sure. Yeah. Um, a lot of the other things that Action and, and Operations Bureau did um, was to go in and look at areas and find out like during an eval, like an evaluation of an area, um, they would do like fire little projects to go find out about this, check out this date, look at this invoice, you know, something, and then you bring it back. And, you know, so there'd be, it's funny. Cause I I've told people I've like, I've, I've done maybe 70, 60, 70 missions in the Sea Org. Yes. And they're like, Oh my God. Cause they think of it as a sit handling. Right. But a lot of them are ops missions that are a couple days or, you know, a, a right. week or, you know, even a couple hours sometimes, you know, yes. and um, it's just part of that whole not talked about very much information gathering, internal facing kind of arm. Yes, um, very definitely. So when you're involved with that, you become you're all over the line. Because I was doing missions under Mike Rinder and OSA, like um, establishing people on post when some of those reorgs are and wise and able and um and Scientology Missions International, you know, putting terminals on post and just doing all those basic functions that you don't think about. Like we weren't always taking people and sending them to the RPF and and doing yes. all that. Um that's fair. So it took that's me a while to, to get up in to those CSP. elements. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Right. Well that's a big part of what some of those middle management or upper management observation arms that's what they, that's what you do. That's your whole purpose. Right. Um, is to be an observation and execution arm for the upper level management. Yes. Um, so it took me a while to get up to CST and finally I got my clearances approved. And, you know, when you're on clearance lines, I had a lot of freedom. You know, I, I was able, I had to do my PRF again, um, which is like your detox thing, which I'd done like two or three times in my life which I had never taken drugs or drank anything until after I left the Sea Org. So, so why, no did, sense, why did was, you have to redo it? Um, oh my gosh. You were talking to, you know, it's funny. You were talking to Janice um, the other day and you guys were talking about the false purpose rundown. And um, we at the Flag Land Base had been introduced. We had been introduced to that at probably about the same time it did like everybody got switched to fprd because i was also fully hatted for my post which got me more money <laughs> and then you were all of a sudden not fully hatted for your post anymore and you had to do this false purpose rundown which and a lot of us to, had to do them which on was to handle your evil purposes right right and and honestly as messengers we spent half the time wondering if we were suppressives anyways wow like, am i a suppressive like we would drive on <laughs> like we were our you know it was just such a it was unnecessary. It was almost, but during the false purpose rundown, I originated accidentally. Oh, I don't know. Accidentally, I originated the clear cognition. Okay. And um, they didn't know what to do with me because I was just getting, I was being sent to pack to go up lines. And so they're like, you know, CCRD, what do you do? So they just threw me on the pure <laughs> to be like, all right, you're getting sex checked and go on the pure and then you'll do your CCRD or your NED or whatever. Because wow. I haven't even and, done objectives. And, yeah. Wow. 
and sorry, just to back up a little bit, because we probably lost some people there, CCRD right. being the clear certainty rundown. And so you you gave the clear the, the, the statement that indicates that you've reached the state of clear, but people are only that's expected when you're receiving Dianetics auditing, not FPRD. So they probably were confused right. as to what to do with you, I'm guessing. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. The the FPRD auditor was like, are you sure? Can you say that again? I was like, yeah, no, I just, I get it. I've, it's all been like, it's all been done. I'm like, I kind of like, you know, it's, a, it's the whole, like, no matter where you go, there you are. Yeah. I was like, it all makes sense. I'm like, we're all part of the same thing, like matter. And I'm like, I get it. Like, and we mock up a lot and they're just like, you got to stop. Like, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> it was like, we're in a past life thing. And it was like, are you sure? And he's writing this stuff down. And I'm like, yeah, I just, I mean, I'm like, and we were, you know, as messengers and we were required so much, like so much was required of us every day, all day, every week that you operated in this just right here, right now kind of mentality where you're just like, right, I'm right here. I'm in present time. Like, I get it. This is, I'm not living in my past. I'm not in my, I'm just here assimilating data be, and they're just like wait a sec like you're not supposed to vocalize that or you know it was just a big it was a kind of a problem I see. um okay just because i had to get sent to you know there was other intentions at, like, at the time like i had to go to up lines and do my big purpose or whatever so right um, okay so so you redid the purif and finally you got approved and how long how long did it take from when bronwyn arrived at cst to when you got there about nine months wow so that must yeah. have been tough even if she was seeing you on some days off nine months yeah it was like every other week like okay. you know every couple weeks sort of and it was really hard like you, there was only one phone number for cst and it rang at the gatehouse and then okay. there were no internal lines to get you could like ring certain areas but everything went through that that main gatehouse I see. Um, and not somebody somebody wasn't always there so it would just ring forever um and then there was also a switchboard that you called it was, it was a weird like it was multi-levels of like you called the switchboard in two, a 213 area code and then it clicked and then transferred you up to the other and um so yeah then when i got up there a guy named laurel um i forget his post but laurel he used to be copeland. like a helicopter yeah laurel copeland yeah that's right yeah um so he was there and he he's the one that picked me up and drove me up there. Oh wow. And I had no idea, no idea where I was going. Like no clue where I was going. Uh, and I'd never been to Int. Wow. So I went straight up to CST and I started expediting up there. And wow. Yeah, it was it was kind of crazy to go from um like it in it in Florida, the, the management lines were pretty chaotic. Like there was a lot of traffic coming down. You know, I was there when Cheryl DeChef was CEO, and then we went through a couple um, failure, like lasted a month, like Fabio Guioni, and, you know, a few people like made it for like two weeks. Florida was a hot spot. Like you had yes. to be on your game. Um, so Jenny Lindstein and Tom DeVock, or Jenny DeVock and Tom DeVock, got sent in as the CEO right before. And then we got recruited out shortly or a little bit after. Okay. Uh, but I I was you know lucky enough to work with Jenny, for she was our a deputy commanding officer for internal. So I worked with her, um, very, I know every inch of her. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I had to ask. I was like, wait, are you being serious? Did you actually have a good experience with Jenny back then, or are you being sarcastic? I I couldn't quite tell. <laughs> um, Tom was always way cooler than Jenny. I'll say completely, that. Um, completely. He was the cool kind of laid back, you know, didn't have to scream and yell. And um, I mean, we, at the time we had like Pilar Saldariaga, Madge Johnson, uh, Wendy was there for a while, but then she got sent to LA. Um, Eisen, we had Eisenmans, we had um, Dee Dee. And we had a lot of good people. Frank, or uh, the oldest guy, oh God, what was his name? Frank, was it Frank? I can't remember. Um, Richard, Richard Franklin. Okay. Um, that's who it was. Um, and he later got sent somewhere else. But yeah, it was a a, a pretty interesting group um, that were, what was there. 
Interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So go ahead. So, so tell me your first impressions on arriving at CST. What did that feel like compared to where you'd been previously? Well, yeah, I'd come, I was on daily management lines, like in CMRXU uh, at the International Extension Unit, which was down in LA. It was like, you kind of had to be cleared for in because there was so much traffic from management there. And so those lines were so chaotic, so chaotic. Um, stuff just every which, I think mean, all the time. And when I got to CST, it was like in the middle of the mountains. <laughs> it was like, you could hear birds. <laughs> you know, it was like, it was trees. It smelled beautiful. I mean, it was amazing. Um, my first impressions were this was, um, it, it was one, it was beautiful. It was, and it was still an old, the the old inn it's called this uh, was called the squirrel inn <laughs> um Interesting. <laughs> when they bought it right i know right uh that couldn't have gone past the people that bought it you know the right, no. office. i'm sure it's like <laughs> when they wrote that csw they were probably like oh this could fail miserably <laughs> <You know? laughs> we want um, to buy squirrel in different right, definition old, of squirrel <laughs> squirrel like the, the cute little one not the right. not the bad people um, that use scientology outside of paying you gazillions of dollars right exactly yeah so yeah it was a whole different setup um i worked uh with jane mcnairn i i shared an office with her um and uh jim isaacson was my direct senior at the time um really amazing human being i i he was so old school just he cared about you as a human being like you could tell he asked how you were um even russ bellin to a lot i really respected russ bellin when he was there you know, it felt more like what I thought the Sea Org was going to be when I got there yeah. than what I, you know, what I was okay with and what I was okay normalizing. It, it almost was like, wow, I, you could almost breathe and be like, I get it. There actually might be a way to, to save mankind, you know, like, and at the time that was my mindset. I don't really believe that now. Um, Fair enough. <laughs> but yeah, at the time it was very on source, on purpose is what okay. it felt like. Interesting. And so what post did you end up holding there? Um, so at the time, uh, the estate sec was Bruce Bolger okay. and his brother Arthur was there as well. And um, Bruce was for some reason getting sent to the RPF. Um, okay. Wait, sorry. B was it Bruce Bolger or Bolstad? Bolstad, sorry. Okay, Bolstad, okay. no not, worries. Yeah. I just wanted sorry, to make Bronwyn's sure. Bronwyn's dad was your... Bruce Bolger. My yes. dad. Yes. Okay. Um, All yeah. good. Um, so yeah, it was it was Bruce Bolstad and Arthur Bolstad. Okay. Um, and yes. they, um, Bruce was getting sent to the RPF, um, and he knew about it, and but they just wanted him to turn over his hat, his job, because there was so much going on at the time, um, and there was. In a state's division at Lake Arrowhead, there was exactly two people in the states, Bruce wow. and a cook. Um, and and a, I think her name was Amber. Was, was, yes, I remember Amber. So an estates was yeah. all construction, all property maintenance, all. Right. Everything. Everything. Like you, everything to do with carpool, motor pool. Like we had um, a couple Honda Civics that were on base at the time. I don't know why everybody switched to Honda Civics, but that's what we had because <laughs> it had them. We had them. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and we still um, had, they still had those in religious technology center. When I got there, like 10 years later, the same, probably the same Honda, right? Civics. The same one. <laughs> I, as a segue, I did a um, calculation one time and those cars were driving 23 miles every hour, whether they were sitting still or not. Like we drove the crap. We put so many miles on those cars. Yes. Because we would drive them down to author services every week and then up to the amp base and then back to CSD and then down to up. And it was just Ontario airport all the time. Like it, they would never stop moving. You know, Wade yes. Star was our Duracom at the time. Um, but half the time he would be so inundated with stuff. I would end up driving my own weekly reports down to author services and dropping them off for Norman and, um, all those guys, the ED at the time. Um, so that's interesting. So CST was giving reports to author services. Yeah, our weekly. So it was um, 
only the the construction and and all that like the pretty much the underground storage facilities um at that time were done in a photo album and pictures were taken and sent to the main base and then i would caption them and give an update every week on our progress from last week and and that's when um like so my bronwyn at the time was the in charge of human resources for the church of spiritual technology and i was in charge of construction so i had um cob on my lines a lot and bronwyn had cob's assistant on her lines a lot (laughs) and we and we intertwined a bit but like um really anything that i had to do with with shelly at that time was all written um because cst was still trying to go through tax exemption and I see. um it was there was nobody from in really there was not supposed to be a direct correlation of daily inter- interactivity between religious technology center and church of spiritual technology uh, we had different uniforms uh, we didn't wear CR. we had to like technically retire or like um resign from the sea org uh i was told my messenger status no longer applied because people up there weren't messengers some of them and they could be your boss so and those were some of the things that started like for me it was like huh that's odd like because that's so off policy you don't even understand but either way you know it was like so as being you know like i think that's the thing about growing up and always kind of thinking with the technology is when outpoints start popping up, they're very noticeable. Yeah. You know, it's like I you know what you know. You know, you walk a line until it blurs in the Sea Org. If you're on on policy, you're untouchable. If you know the reference and you can point it out, you it's a lot harder to nail you to a wall when you have policy and tech on your side. Right. So you know you pay attention. <laughs> yeah. Survival. A- until in later years and it all became a big blurred mess but yeah no I, I i completely understand what you're saying and so when did you first meet shelly then so um when so nobody was allowed on the base so anytime i would go um as as the as state secretary i would go to the household unit uh quite often and um to we were building lrh houses and we were um doing all the communication and everything that would basically if um lrh returned he was basically set up to have a complete staff places for senior execs to live and and inner work with him uh, but not the same home a different home um yeah. and so a lot of that planning was ongoing because each lrh house was a little bit different yeah. um and, and they kept to like the motif of you know so i dealt with um shelly and david a few times doing uh, household unit stuff and and looking up references and deciding you know how we were going to do um the communicators areas and and just you know what's what what the successful actions and hat write-ups that had been done and you know from everything that was being done at the gold base which was you know at that time they were building the studios um and and the renovations were in progress but not completed by any means okay. um so th- those are, you know, those interactions were very um, parallel, I want to say, you know, where it, I didn't feel like a junior and I didn't feel like a senior. Um, it felt more like a peer, not with, never with like David Miscavige ever. Yeah. Um, but with Shelly, it felt more pe- like just exchange of data. Um, and right. then the other times were when the events of, um, when we'd have events at the shrine. So we would be bust down and RTC would be bust down and everybody from gold would be bust down and we'd all show up kind of at the same time, but from different places, obviously. And um, we would be sat either in front of the side or behind RTC. Okay. And and it was usually kind of based on how well we were doing at the time (laughs) on where we got sat, I think is kind of what it felt like, you know, if everything was going good, then we would be sat in the front and then we'd be like front and center. And if not, we would be behind RTC, but, um, and so every once in a while intermingle. So, um, those were brief exchanges. Um, and then when I really met and knew, kind of got to know Shelly 
was when I was sent to um, the DEX from CST. Okay. And this would be like 91, early 92 kind of thing. Um, okay. And, and, and sent to, uh, and what, okay. So sent to the DEX, meaning you're taken off your position and now you're on heavy manual labor and undergoing extreme handlings. And why were you sent to the DEX? You you should out of everybody should appreciate this. Um, so my my st main statistic as the estate secretary was a, a stat called square paces, and um, that basically is number of paces of usable space in an area. So every building has a square pace, every porch has a square pace, every so you basically take every area on the base and you break it down into square footage, and Usable space means something that's clean, organized, like there's no trash on the ground. If somebody throws a wrapper on the ground, that's not, you can't count that as square paces. That has leaves, you know, those kind of things. Um, the, the weird nuance with the square paces stat is that you can report the square paces stat, but it's not recorded or approved until the master at arms goes and inspects it. Right. So I could say I have a thousand square paces and they could go boom and be like, no, there's leaves on this porch or this. You have 700 square paces <laughs> and you're just like, oh, crap. And that's what you have. You have no choice. Um, so um, I was it was like pretty much a Wednesday night, Thursday morning. I um, was scheduled to fly out to New Mexico. And um, so Tom Vorm and, and Russ and I were getting ready to drive down to the Ontario airport. And I reported my square paces to Eric Wheelis and he, who was the MA. Oh no, maybe it was Tom Willis at the time. I think it was Tom. Um, or he was the Durainar and Eric was the MA either way. Um, okay. And Durainar is the director of inspections reports and, and MAA is master at arms. So it's very yes. paramilitary. Um, and I, I went to Ontario airport. We, um, talked about a few things. They were flying out to Japan to deal with um, the time capsules and the Mark 8 E-meter stuff at the time, way back then. Yeah. And, um, uh, and then I flew out to New Mexico, to Albuquerque, and then they flew off to parts unknown because they that was above my pay grade at the time. You know, okay. anything, when, when they stopped talking about time capsules, I was asked to be like, Go get a soda and be gone with you because it was the Mark 8 stuff. So it was um, very compartmentalized even at, at those levels. Yes. Uh, so I flew out to New Mexico and I was out at New Mexico. Um, we were finishing that. We had finished up pretty much the whole base. We had the LRH house was done. Our generator sets were pretty much all right. You know, we were just everything was moving along. And all of a sudden I got called back to the base. Like you need to come back immediately. And I was like, oh, okay. And I did. I mean, I came back. And when I got there, I was met by the master at arms. And they escorted me to a car. And we drove down to Happy Valley in the middle of the night. Wow. And Bronwyn, to, as a caveat, had basically been summoned down to RTC um, prior to that uh, in, I want to say, 91, early 91. Um, and she, as soon as she got summoned down because of no stats, she basically had zero products in a whole year. Okay. And her stat graph looked, you know, it was zero every, every week. It was hard to, hard to watch. Uh, <laughs> but it was, her job was to get people up to CST, which was nearly impossible because the right. qualifications were ridiculous. Um, and so she got summoned down to, to um, RTC prior, like months prior and um, was expediting under Shelly, directly under Shelly Miscavige. Um, and she, I believe she did like, you know, messed work or dex work, um, but was never on the RPF. So okay. she was just, and then she became an RTC expediter. She's actually in that picture um, of the ship. Yes. Of all the people in RTC. Yeah, she's like way up in the very top. Yes. Right. Uh, and I believe that's when she was like just barely expediting um, for RTC or had gone through kind of a program. Um, yes. So I got pulled down and so she was on the base and I got sent down to Happy Valley and um, to do, and then we weren't really told anything. We were just sent down there. 
and told to do messed work and that we would be sec checked. And so we went from like, I was in New Mexico, <laughs> like I was working. Uh, and so I think part of now looking back is that we, we had, they kept us segregated from everybody because of where we were. Right. And what we were doing. So we were yes. kept separate and we were made to sleep separately. And so like the decks, there was a lot of other people on the decks at the time, but we weren't allowed to like really interact very much with them. It was very, hmm. um, it was kept very separate. And um, that was a lot of time where the, there was a lot of Sea Org trunks out. It was before they renovated. So it was still Happy Valley and not the Ant Ranch kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so there was a ton of like old Sea Org trunks and hats and pictures. And so us having been where we were, we were tasked with going through a lot of that and looking mm -hmm. for any out security, um, any, you know, any confidential sensitive information that we could find while we're getting sec checked, while we're doing all this. So we're doing wow. all that. So, oh. Sorry. And so the purpose of that was to remove those things before those trunks were sent to their rightful owners who had already left? Uh, no. Yeah. Um, it was before we put them into big dumpsters and packed them to the oh trash. Oh, my the gosh. Yeah, Seriously? It was, yeah, big dumpsters showed up, and wow. uh, we ended up dumping. But it was, you know, no out security. And if you did have out security, it was a big, huge issue. So um, you didn't want anything leaving that would have been sensitive or been able to, to be found. Yeah, um, like the, like pictures so, with David Miscavige, I'm assuming, or letters right, from exactly. L. Ron and, Hubbard or any, right. any handwritten. Which, yes. Yeah, any handwritten, even personal stuff, even like, you know, from one high in, high up terminal to another, you wow. know, at the time it was just, you know, and, and that was probably to later be vetted or, or whatever. Um, and then probably ultimately thrown away, I would imagine. But that's so I, I, we interact, Shelly would come out um, and talk to us and just kind of like, you know, okay, you're going to keep getting sec check. You do this. And she would RPF people or tell people like, you know, you're going to the RPF now or, or have like PK and security do it. Um, or something, you know, like it, it depended. Um, and there weren't a ton of, but CSP so, people at the time. sorry. So, you, but you still didn't really know what brought this on for you? No. Um, no, I, I didn't really know other than I told, I was told that I falsified my square paces stat. Wow. And I was like, that's impossible. Like you can't do that. So I right there. And, and I had been riding Bronwyn for the past eight months uh, from CST down to RTC and never got a response, never got anything in return, birthday cards. You know, I was like, we went down to Crestline. We go to that store that Shelly was seeing. And we go, that was where we went to go get our basic toiletries and stuff hmm. um, was Crestline. Because that was our the closest store that had everything you needed. Yeah. Um, and Lake Arrowhead is kind of a trek. It's like a 25 minute drive from the base. So, um, yeah. So it was really at the time I, I had a lot of attention on my wife. I really loved her. Yeah. And so. <laughs> Um, I wasn't able to have any, I didn't even know she was okay. That's all. It, it was weird. Cause I looked back at what I was writing and it was just like, Hey, happy birthday, this and that. And how are you doing? How's it? I hope everything's good. I hope you get back up here quick. You know, like it was, and nothing, like nothing came back. And so when I was on the decks, it was ramped up more. I was, I remember she had a birthday, I think, um, or it was our anniversary. And I wrote a card and said, and it's like, nothing like there was nothing in return and, and so when were we were this time i was 20 I think, okay right so you've there. been married or for like about 19, four years two years yeah, yeah exactly wow um and it was i mean we we when we got i don't know when you got married and we were both messing like it was kind of like we were gonna get married for a few lifetimes <laughs> like that was the whole idea like, it was more if there was such a thing as like a soulmate that was like that, you know, that was my soulmate. And that wow. was the person that I, um, in an, a real, in a religious setting, it, it, you know, it was more, it meant more than, you know, these laws of these un, uninformed masses. Right. It meant, you know, it, it, we were going to save the planet together. Either way. Um, yeah. 
No, I, I get what it, you're it, saying. It, Having signed a billion year contract at 14, you were no stranger to serious commitment. Let's just say. Right. Yeah. No. And, and <laughs> um, you know, I don't know. It's I, I've always kind of I I think that love is important. I think that you know that that bond, that willingness to share time and space with another human being is that's the gift we have as yeah. humans. And, and it's um, it's hard when that's suppressed. You yeah, know, so for sure. me, I had a lot of attention on that while I was doing the decks and and so much so that that became a focus of my of my problem is that you need to knock it off and start focusing on your job and stop focusing on, you know, the per, your wife and all this. And it's like, well, and I'm thinking like, well, that's we were recruited to go up there as a couple like we were supposed like they didn't do that for people who were wishy washy because in the Sea Org, divorce and marriage was just a consideration you did it. it it meant nothing it was like people would get divorced married divorced married it didn't you know like it was so just normalized you know right. and then and it, when which the is odd. issue yeah which is odd because it seems so contrary i mean uh, let's not go down the the contradiction right. rabbit hole right, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well and you know obviously a lot of it's ultimately for control right. um but you know, when you really looked at what we grew up with dynamics and that second dynamic, that that's what, where we bonded, I felt was on that level, not on some, you know, civilian people that had, I, I refrain from using the word, you know, wog, because I think right. it's very, you know, derogatory. Um, it is. Uh, it, so, and, and even separate to the definition of we, it, on all definitions, as far as I know, or at least most definitions is derogatory. <laughs> Right. Well, and you were just, it basically meant that we had disdain for humanity that were not informed with this technology. Right. And, and it was, it was cultivated. It was nurtured. It was, it was like, you were expected to have disdain. And that was part of the fear of why you didn't leave is you were going into a chaotic environment right. that was just eat you up and kill you. Like you, you know, you might as well just read OT3 if you're not, you know, and just die. <laughs> you know, so. Um, True. So yeah, it was, I had a lot of attention on that. And um, so that's when I started getting a lot more attention from Shelly and from, you know, it's like, it was, I was uh, told on a few occasions to knock off my crap, focus on me and get through this shit, you know? Bye, Shelly. And, uh -huh. wow. and my usual response was, well, how come I, how is Bronwyn okay? Like, what is she doing? How come she doesn't respond to my communication? How come this and that? And then I started to figure out that she, Shelly, was suppressing my communication with Bronwyn and suppressing Bronwyn's communication with me. And um, the the next time I saw her, I kind of confronted her on that. And, and you know, this is the weird thing. It's like, it never considered, I, this is going to sound so ignorant. Um, it never really occurred to me that she was a messenger. That Shelly was a messenger. Yeah. Because she okay. was an RTC. Yep. Yes. It, it just, it was so, it did not occur. So, and the reason why I preface that is what I'm about to say what makes more sense that way. <laughs> um, is I was, I basically was like, you know, if LRH was here, you would be the one going to the RPF, not me. You would be the one, because this is a suppressive act. We, we don't have, you know, we're not enemy lines. There's no... You know, I was so sure of it in my head. And um, I remember her just looking at me and kind of scoffing, like, how dare you? Mm -hmm. And then leaving and walking. And I was just like, huh. And I went back to mess work. <laughs> and then. <laughs> you had the oh, audacity oh, to yeah. stand up to Shelly. Well, and I, and like, and not even to make an excuse, but it was out of pure ignorance. Like, right. I believed in being a messenger so much at that time still after having not been one for years at cst like it was that i knew that's what i relied on that's what i was had it on that's it, it just was like it was my neural pathways at the time and yeah. i was so sure of my tech you know i was like this is you would i was 100 percent. and so i got sent to the rpf's rpf um later that day <laughs> wow um and probationally declared so, um, holy moly. So, got... let, so let's walk that back for a minute. So rehabilitation project force is their slave camp slash mental reprogramming. 
you went even wor- one la- layer deeper than that to the rehabilitation project force within the rehabilitation project force. And <laughs> yes, on top yeah. of that, you're given a probational declare, which means basically that you blink wrong once and boom, that's it. You're out. You're a suppressive person. And I don't know if you remember this part, but for people at that property, there is a Hubbard advice. So, you know, in general terms, if you ask a Scientologist, it's always like, oh, leave the door open a crack so that when, if they decide to recant and come back and, you know, then they can do so. But for people from that property, Hubbard said, yeah, slam it shut, bolt it shut, never, never, no recourse. Right. Yeah, it's irreversible and irrevocable and all that. Right. Um, right. No, yeah. I that was definitely something that I I I realized the full force of that. <laughs> so um I did the RPS RPF for a while. Um and I wrote up OWs and um I I was made to sleep under the RPF MA's desk. So that because I was considered a pretty pretty big security risk at the time. Um which was weird because I didn't originate leaving or anything. Um, but they treated me like what we just did to you, you're going to leave. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. really an odd, it was an odd feeling. So being Mr. Smarty Pants, fully hatted HR person, I was like, I want to be put on the leaving staff writing form. After about, probably about a month or two of writing up OWs and this process and it, and, um, with, and I knew the point of the, that routing form is to keep you on staff, but I, I felt at the time I wanted to go through the process because just getting sec checked and writing up o- overts and withholds it was it just felt like there was a, a time for probably four months I didn't look or talk to another person. Wow! Like we would we were behind, like the 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 way Happy Valley was set up, there was some trailers like a few hundred yards back where I guess they had kept like Vicky Asneran and stuff when she was and that's where the rpf at the time was and there was that's where the rpf was rpf's rpf was in like a little i don't even know what it was it wasn't um it was like a shack kind of um and so that's where you kind of you and walking back and forth the rpf would have to go to the van and they'd have to meet up at the main house to go there um and so i remember walking that walk i all i remember was the ground that's all I remember is because I would just look down. That's all I did for for months. Like just wow. look at the and not knowing I cannot talk to I can't originate communication. I can respond if somebody talks to me. Yeah. <laughs> but I can't, you know, um, and I ha- and I have to respond, you know, very carefully and and very particular. Um so that was really hard. Um and I did that long enough to get kind of back where I was actually getting sent to the base again. Um, and, you know, being able, even though we still had to eat after the RPF, um, which was kind of a bummer because we, you got like maybe three minutes, maybe three minutes to to eat eat. whatever was left over, (laughs) right? Whatever's left over. Yeah, pretty much. Wow. And then, um, at the time I, my, my wisdom teeth were coming in, um, or had come in and one was messed up. So I, I got, um, a wisdom tooth yanked out when I was on the RPF and, um, you know, we, you were allowed like two hours to recuperate and motor pull on the ground. And then you were pretty you much even given any Novocaine and, for that. Um, no, I was given a shot, like a local oh. shot. Oh my God. And that's cause they, you couldn't do like Novocaine. I didn't think was something that was possible there. I don't think I wasn't offered it. Yeah, <laughs> they, I was they terrified used... of dentists anyway. So. Oh my gosh. It's just so on so many levels. So wrong. Ugh. Um, not to not to cut you off completely, but um, I think we might have to finish this up in part two. What are your thoughts? Oh yeah, no. However, um, I don't time just. <laughs> so, yeah, <absolutely. laughs> time time flies by when we're talking about this nonsense, right? Right, and oh. it's you know if you write if you're asked the right questions, it's easier to kind of articulate those. You know, to originate yeah. it all would be harder, but yes. to you know somebody to help add color to it 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 really yeah i guess it you know it it becomes more detailed yes no very definitely no i am i am probably i'm going to uh you know get in trouble with the audience for leaving a complete cliffhanger but i i also want to want you to have the the space and time to 
to finish all of your Shelley experiences. And, and also I'm dying to know what happened with Bronwyn, of course. Yeah, that's something I haven't, um, it, uh, yeah, I haven't really talked about a lot. Um, and we don't have to. I'm more than, no, Whatever. I'm more than happy to. I, I need, okay. I, it, it's something I need um, because that was, yeah, I, it's just, it hasn't been the right, you know, circuit. It, I don't know. It's just, it's so intimately personal to me. Yeah. You know, that's where I decided to leave. I, it was just really hard to leave a lot of things behind. Yeah. For completely. my, and that's how terrified and afraid I felt for me. Yeah. And I, that's probably the only time in my entire life that I've chosen myself. So, um, which didn't end up really amazing. Um, cause I ended up, you know, it ended up really awful actually. Um, but. I'm totally happy to go through that because it's okay. it's part of the process and it, and it's just um, awesome. It's well, yeah. yeah, no, totally. Well, for today, we'll wrap up here um, and we'll we'll schedule to do part two and we'll just go through whatever pieces of it that you're comfortable with and you know whatever you're you're willing to share and um, it's just embarrassing. It's, it's more than any you know. It's, it's just stuff. I understand. Well, <laughs> you certainly have brought a different color to Shelly uh, in this, this episode so far. And, um, and I'll look forward to hearing the rest of your um, experiences and going through that in part two. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having of, me. Of course, Dylan. I will talk to you soon. Thank you, as always, for your time. And always a pleasure hearing your stories. I think this is more, I've, more of what... I, you and I have talked about probably ever. Would you agree? Yeah, I do. I, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yes. Awesome. All righty. Well, thank you again. And I'll look forward to part two.